thank you very much for joining us for today's uh, lunch and a lecture by uh, uh, Amin uh, Sophia Mer, uh, uh, whom I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing uh, this afternoon. Uh, please do at least silence your cell phones uh, if you've not already done so. And also, um, uh, we have a sign-in sheet which we ask everybody to sign in, please. Even if you have signed up and are getting our, are on our listserv, please sign in again. You can indicate that you already are on our listserv, that you're not but would like to be, or that you're not and don't want to be. And we will honor that request, but we used to be able to report our numbers to our uh, federal funding uh, agency. Now we have to do more than that. My guess is that people were cheating on the numbers and so now they require uh, the rest of us uh, to uh, um, um, do more than just provide. Uh, so we have to provide actually uh, the email address. So please sign in uh, as the lists are circulating. Um, so uh, I should point out that uh, Mr. Sophia Mayer is a PhD student in the uh, Department of New Eastern Languages and Cultures and in the Department of uh, Philosophy. His research focuses on uh, both political philosophy and intellectual history of Western and Islamic classical philosophy. Uh, he uh, has recently been published in uh, Iranica Analytica, um, um, which uh, is an article in an article in which he discusses Al Farabi's uh, political philosophy. He holds a BA from the University of Oklahoma in Middle Eastern Studies and in Arabic, uh, as well as an MA in International Studies and Global Security and an MA in Philosophy from uh, the same uh, university. I'm very pleased uh, and ask you to welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Sophia Mayer, whose lecture today is on Al Farabi's reflection on the possibility of a universal Islamic regime. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming here, and thank you Sesame for giving me this opportunity to talk about Al Farabi. Sometimes I refer to him as my philosophical lover. <laughs> so I'm pleased to share my fund of philosophy and Farabi with you today. So today I'm going basically to talk about Al Farabi's political philosophy in general, and he his question or his problem of possibility of an Islamic universal regime. So before getting into discussion, some just introduction and stuff uh, we need to know about him and his time. So Al-Farabi uh, was born 1870 and lived a long life for medieval periods and he died 1950. And we don't know anything about his origin. Basically, people, some people believe that he had a like, Turkish origin. Other people believe that he was Persian. But in a recent research, Rudolf, I think he's a German scholar, he convincingly argued that uh, he was Persian. But we don't know for sure, and there is no solid evidence uh, about his life. But what we know about him, that he had an extensive knowledge of languages, philosophy, music, and basically whatever considered as science of his time. He has a big book on Musiqi al Kabir on, on, on music, which is a masterpiece uh, on musical discussions in medieval period. So he was a, like a basically Renaissance man before Renaissance happened. <laughs> um, so uh, Al-Farabi rightly is known as the founder of political philosophy in Islamic civilization. We might argue about the notion of Islamic civilization, but just for sake of argument, he was the founder of political philosophy. That's true, but that's not the whole picture. Basically, um, he revived and resurrected political philosophy and uh, in medieval periods, so if you uh, go back to that time, um, Christian didn't basically have extensive uh, discussion on political philosophy, uh, again because of the revelation, because of the church, and um, Jews in there. So basically, uh, Al-Farabi is a revival of political philosophy within 
greater tradition that we call it a Abrahamic tradition. So it's true al far away that we basically have the discussion about philosophy and what is the relationship between the human soul, human happiness, and civic, and civic life. And he introduced or reintroduces uh, philosophy why we have the challenge of revelation. So if we go back to ancient Greek, ancient Greek basically, political philosophy starts with Socrates. So Socrates tries to understand what he calls the tone on propone, whatever it's related to a human being or human affairs. And it is uh, famous that he brought philosophy down from sky to earth. So that's uh, basically the beginning of, of political philosophy. So at that time, um, we see a kind of tension between Greek paganism and also uh, philosophers. Why was the tension there? Okay, so one of the fundamental questions of uh, Greek uh, intellectuals was what is the arche or arche? Arche means basically the, the origin of the universe. So what is the origin of the universe? So there were two um, group of people. One group of people believed that the origin of the universe, there are gods. Like Hesiod in his uh, works and days, basically considered gods and divinity as, as the source of God. There were other people, as philosophers, they considered basically um, um, natural phenomena as, 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 uh, as origin of the universe. You may have heard that Thales, for example, he believed that water is the origin of the universe. I mean, it, it sounds a little bit funny to us how water can be origin of the universe, but, but historically it's very significant because uh, water is part of the universe. So it's a natural phenomenon. So basically, uh, the philosophical background of it is that the significance of it is that we can explain the universe based on natural phenomena without appealing to God, so divinity. So, so we can trace back the, 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 the roots of uh, philosophy called secularism back to ancient Greek, basically. So they, we can provide a rational account of, of cosmos without mentioning God. So that's a significant. So, but, so you see the tension. We have gods as origin of the universe, and we have basically natural phenomena. So that's a tension based on the beginning of philosophy between like, Greek paganism and, and uh, philosophy. So what is political philosophy? I mean, today, um, we teach political philosophy in the philosophy department as a small branch of philosophy. We have philosophy of religion, philosophy of language, philosophy of race, uh, philosophy of gender, and we have many philosophies, and one branch is political philosophy. But this is not the way that ancient taught about political philosophy. Political philosophy was a comprehensive discipline and dealing with, with the greatest good of human being. What is the greatest good? and how we can attain happiness, or is it true happiness attainable for human beings or not? So basically whatever related to that fundamental question was considered as, as political philosophy, and political philosophy was a, was a normative science, I mean, uh, despite today that we say that political science should deal with facts, not, not values, so, uh, ancient belief that that idea is, is stupid. I mean, you cannot separate facts from the uh, so, uh, so, basically, to ancient political philosophy is an endless inquiry for human greatest good or happiness. So, what is human life is the basic question or fundamental question of ancient political philosophy. And Al Farabi as a person who thinks in this paradigm of tradition basically deals with that fundamental question. In that sense, he's a political philosopher, not in the modern sense. So in the time of Al-Farabi, we have revealed religion, which is basically in Islam, 
And uh, at that time, so Abbasid period, so Muslims started to expand their land and are trying to basically imitate Persians, Romans, and, and, and build empires. Uh, and Farab is witnessing this. So in, be, because uh, they have many people to rule over and many lands to rule over, they need law and administration. Therefore, Islam takes basically the shape of law in order to govern the community of Muslim believers. So the question is that, is the religious law necessary or sufficient for salvation or not? Some people say that is is necessary but not sufficient, but other people say that it's both necessary and sufficient. Other people <coughs> believe that it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Um, for example, uh, Razi, he was like um, a free, people call it free thinker. He criticized a religion, prophecy, I mean, the life after, after death, and called all of the superstitions. But this is not the wrath that Farabi takes. Some people believe that Farabi, uh, like, he didn't believe that, but he didn't express it publicly, and we will see why he did not do that, because he believes that religion is basically the backbone of more, uh, public morality. And once you take religion away from people, uh, it doesn't make them more moral. More, more, it makes them worse. But it doesn't mean that religion cannot go astray and basically uh, make people to do horrible things. But how to reform religion? We need a philosophical authority treatment or philosophical care. Sorry my poor imagination for that expression, but I think that I will explain more about what, what you are doing. So, al farabi views a marriage between political ambitions and religious zeals as one of the fundamental problems of human life. So the offspring, the offspring of this, it, it, this marriage is both dangerous for intellectual life as well as political life. So what we do with that, so basically that's a thesis I'm going to defend today. So if the fundamental problem of human life is basically political ambitions and religious passion. So as a philosopher, as an as a educator, what, what we do with it, how we can deal with it, how we solve the problem. Okay, so I think that, so his solution is to temper and tame political ambitions and religious zeal through philosophy, philosophy treatment. So I believe that Al-Farabi's political philosophy should be viewed as an attempt to tackle this fundamental problem of human life. Okay, so let's go back to um, the question, the main question that you are dealing with. So is a universal, virtuous, universal regime possible or not? Al-Farabi actually enumerated several um, reasons why it is not possible. But here, because of sake of time, I'm just mentioning two reasons and expanding on the first one, actually, the first reason. So it would be possible if two conditions could be met. So one condition would be if a state of per perpetual war was reasonable or just. If we prove that, the state of perpetual war is reasonable and also is just and fair. And also, if, if we can make philosophers to become kings, then yes, that universal, Islamic universal regime is possible. But if this is not possible, then this is not possible either. So it's a deductive argument. Right? So uh, what he thinks about first reason? So, uh, so how we temper, how we tame um, political ambitions then? So the main feature of a Farabi's philosophy treatment is that he presents a religious belief as a philosophical opinion. And philosophical opinion can be true or false, but how we know that it's true or false, it has a true value. 
we need to examine it. But if it is religious dogma, we just accept it as a matter of faith. So basically, that's his, his, his treatment. To present a religious belief as a philosophical opinion, okay, it's a philosophical opinion of why it is true, let's examine it, let, let's evaluate it. By doing this, he opens the possibility of examining religious dogmas, unlike dialectical theology, Kalam, which intends to defend religious dogma. So therefore, what Farvey does is not, is not theology. It, it, it's philosophy, it's political philosophy. Okay, so that's the end of the introductory thing. So let's deal with the basically first condition. Basically the condition is that if the state of perpetual war is just, then we have one condition done for a universal Islamic uh, regime to be possible. So I'm going to just read this, I think it's easier for both of us maybe. <coughs> so offensive jihad is one of the notions that contains a high, if not the highest dose of religious zealous passion, which possibly can be prob pro problematic for two areas of human life, first philosophical life, and second political life. Al-Farabi's treatment of offensive jihad is intended to tame these passions and make it suitable on the one hand for political life and on, on the other hand for defending philosophical inquiries in cities. In this section, I explain how and why Al-Farabi's Farabi, political inquiry tames the passion of jihad. Al-Farabi's approach toward offensive jihad is complex. He presents conflicting views about jihad, and it makes it harder to know what his own belief is about it. It is an absurd hermeneutical point if we believe that whatever opinion a philosopher expresses is his own. Expression is not necessarily an assertion. He expresses a variety of opinions about jihad, sometimes without using the word jihad. However, however the question is that what hermeneutical principles we need to use toward his text that might lead us to reveal his own belief about jihad. What is certain is that Al-Farabi never expresses his own belief on jihad explicitly. It doesn't mean that he doesn't express it explicitly. <coughs> on the surface, he uses Islamic views and, work, and, and generally accepted opinions that might misleadingly be interpreted as his own view. However, we have learned from Al-Farabi that general acceptance is not the truth maker, and the truth can be intention with generally cher cherished opinions. At the beginning of the quote. Furthermore, it is obvious what is most useful and not noble is in every case either most noble according to generally accepted opinion, most noble according to a particular religion, or truly most noble. End of the quote. Uh, is Tassil, Attainment of Happiness, Section 33. Al-Farabi is a philosophic educator who delicately brings the generally accepted opinions of his contemporaries under the light of philosophical investigation. He makes truth-seeking believers to contemplate along with him in order to examine the validity of their opinions as well as their effects on their inner life, namely their soul, and other life uh, cities without provoking the destructive religious zeals or passions. For this reason, he employs a style of writing that imitates the form of dialogue, which communicates with different individuals differently. The conflicting views that we see in Al-Farabi's writing about jihad represent this style of writing that he uses to cultivate philosophical inquiry in his society as well as taming the religious passion through philosophical education. To Al-Farabi, some of the Islamic ideals such as jihad, offensive jihad, need a philosophical treatment or care in order to be tamed. In a crucial se section of aphorism 67, Al-Farabi enumerates different type, types of war, uh, al -Hab. He only denounces the type of wars that he mentions in the latter two paragraphs 
of the section 67 as unjust. In the first two paragraphs of the section, he mainly uses war. In the first two paragraphs, the third type of war as both bother war and partners agree resembles the tradition definition of jihad. But he does not use the word jihad. The definition of the third type of the word is as follows, beginning of the quote. Or it is carrying and forcing a certain group to what is best and most fortunate for them in themselves, as distinct from others when they have not cognized, cognizant of it on their own and have not submitted to someone who is a cognizant of it and call them to it by speech. End of the quote. This definition is is strikingly characterized as a philosophical opinion about war, but it is religious in nature. But the puzzle is why Al Farabi presents the definition of jihad in a philosophical manner. He does not refer to the third type of a war as just. However, by referring to the second typology of war as unjust, he makes his reader misleadingly believe that he first the first typology of war might be just. This is the level of text that might have been intended by him to communicate with the religiously motivated reader. However, the passage preserves the philosophical discussions with its more philosophical prone readers through his philosophical presentation of jihad, which invites the philosophical reader to examine jihad. Although, he, in the third definition of war, presents jihad as a philosophical opinion. He does not argue for its truth. He does not argue for its falsehood either. However, the fact that he avoids an argument either for or against the third definition gives the, gives the reader a hint that the legitimacy of an offensive war cannot be accepted if there is no philosophical proof. Even if we accept Kramer's interpretation, that this definition of war is the virtuous city civil, civilizing mission, we know from elsewhere how this mission can be near to impossible. As Al Farabi asserts in his philosophy of Aristotle, civil, civil, civilizing, civilizing mission sorry, can be foolish. Um, I'm quoting him. Consequently, there may be a number of virtuous nations and virtuous cities whose religions are different, even though they all pursue the very same kind of happiness. For religion is but the impressions of these things or the impression of their images <coughs> imprinted in the soul, because it is difficult for the multitude to comprehend these things themselves as they are. The attempt was made to teach them these things in other ways, which are the ways of imitation. Hence, these things are imitated for each group or nation through the matters that are best known to them. And it may very well be that what is best known to the one may not be best known to the other. So basically, he, he, he defends that there is a plurality of, of, of happinesses. Why? Because human natures are different, and, and human societies are different. By doing this, he basically tamed the passion of the pious to inflict or to impose their own version of happiness on other people. So, in the political regime, in uh, the work of Farabi, a Farabi in direct critique of, of offensive jihad appears in the form of criticizing ignorant cities, namely the democratic city and domination. Democratic, uh, it comes from uh, Tumas, uh, the Greek word, so basically means that the spirited part of the, of the soul, or the honor-like uh, loving part of the soul. Um, the ignorant city is a type of non-virtuous city, and the democratic city 
the kind of ignorant city which like all of the non-virtuous cities are built on a misconception of happiness. In the eye of the inhabitants of the democratic city, honor is the most praiseworthy good. They cooperate with one another to seek honor and value the rulers who bring them the most honor. Another vice of democracy is its fascination with domination, seeking excessive honor, cultivating them the love of domination. Beginning of the quote, there is another thing very beloved of many of the inhabitants of the ignorant cities, namely domination. According to many of them, the one who achieves it is to be admired. Therefore, that ought also to be counted among what is meritorious for the ignorant cities. For according to them, the most exalted thing a human being is to be honored for is being well known for domination over one, two, or many things. End of the quote. Since honor appears the highest good in the eye of the inhabitants of the democratic city, everything else will be seen as a tool toward obtaining it, either wealth or domination. The honor seekers, in order to feed their own desire for honor, need admirers to honor them. The admirers offer their honor in exchange of money or goods. As a result, honor seekers must always obtain new resources to keep the admirers around. Therefore, they are always looking to dominate others for their positions or money. At the beginning of the quote, they take that money from the city either in the manner of the tax or they dominate a faction other than the inhabitants of the city for their money, bring it to the treasure house and use it as a reserve for making great expenditures in the city so as to gain greater honor, end of the quote. Hence, seeking honor requires dominating, which in return demands the dominated. Such people, when they establish a kingdom, they will rule over their subjects so that they honor them. Although Al-Farabi never uses the word offensive jihad, it is not hard to catch the hints that he throws at the reader. For instance, in section 102, he notes that such a ru ruler legislates traditional laws, sunnah concerning honor. So basically, he refers to, to traditional laws for these people as sunnah. I mean, sunnah is. Uh, immediately in the next section, he mentions that democracy is the best among the ignorant cities. However, he, warn he warns the reader about the possibility for democracy to turn into tyranny, which, uh, beginning of the quote, is fit for the being transferred into beginning a city of domination because of the excessive love of honor in it, end of the quotation. As his discussion proceeds, his critic of domination becomes harsher, especially when, when he analyzes the vices of the city of domination. When domination becomes the ultimate good in a city and its inhabitants, and its inhabitants aid one another to expand their domination, then a city of domination comes into existence. Beginning of the quote. Their love and their purpose in all of that are domination, conquest, humiliation, humiliation, and that the conquered possess neither himself nor any other thing for the sake of which he has been dominated, but is subject to obeying the conqueror in whatever passion it has. End of the quote. For a reader of Al-Farabi who is familiar with the notion of offensive jihad, it is not hard to see parallels between Al-Farabi characterization of domination and offensive jihad. There are, of, that's the beginning of the quote, there are of the opinion that they should dominate everything and everybody. End of the quote. However, Al-Farabi advances his critique against it in a subtle manner, without stealing the religious zeal of his community. Once again, in section 106, he refers to dominators' laws as sunnah, and its rules to institutionalize dominations. Beginning of the quote. All of their traditional laws, sunnah is a sunnah, are traditional laws and prescriptions such that 
been adhered to, they are fit for dominating others. Their rivalry and boosting is either about the frequency of their domination, its greatness, or their abundant acquisition of the equipment and instruments of domination. End of the quote. The desire of domination stems from excessive love of honor, and each of these desires give birth to their corresponding ignorant cities. In political regime, he undertakes to critique the notion of offensive jihad through classifying it as the end of two types of ignorant cities, either the democratic city or the city of domination. Unlike Plato in the Republic, who present Tumas in a positive light, Al-Farabi views Tumas as a major agent responsible for the democratic city's descent into tyranny and ultimately into the city of domination. Plato in the Republic maintains that Tumas is receptive to reason, while Eros is deaf to reason. His hope is that by making Tumas subordinate to reason, Eros can be either restrained or it can be redirected toward forms, forms with capital F. For Al-Farabi, Tumas is equally deaf to reason and blameworthy for deceiving reason. Um, by doing this, offensive jihad is no longer an unexamined common opinion, that's expression that he uses, <coughs> when it is presented philo philosophically. His approach makes it a philosophical examinable opinion that might be true or false. However, to determine its validity, one must examine it, examine it carefully. However, the fate of the multitude is attached to this unexamined common opinion. As a result, the Farabi as an educator and not as an ideologue does not denounce this offensive jihad overtly. He presents jihad philosophically in order to replace the religious justification of jihad with the philosophical justification so that at the end it becomes a form of just war that requires a philosophical justification. While he has shown that it is impossible to prove the justice of the war if the objective is building a universal virtuous regime. By doing this, Al-Farabi has <coughs> tamed the two months of offensive jihad and made it healthy for the soul and for the city. Thank you for listening. <coughs> yes, please. So is your conclusion that there can be an Islamic universal regime? It cannot. There cannot? No. Uh, either it's impossible, uh, because the conditions that we need to meet is near to impossible. Even if it is uh, possible, it's not desirable, because it leads to destructive results. It requires perpetual war and perpetual war, the state of perpetual war cannot be reasonable. I mean, no reasonable person can agree that the state of perpetual, perpetual war is a desirable situation. And no one can say that all wars can be just wars. Therefore, universal <coughs> virtuous regime is possible. So, yes? So why is the first uh, Islamic Republic so important? that there has to be uh, universal, uh, perpetual war. Like, why why should that be? Well, because it's universal, you know, but either you need to basically expand your land, and you need to defend your land against uh, against um, foreigners, you know, to, to maintain your land. So basically, that's a fundamental problem of Machiavelli, how to gain power, maintain it, and expand it. So, um, and uh, Machiavelli says that basically, to do that, um, you need to be either lion or fox. So you need to be uh, either manipulative as a fox or you can be strong as a lion. So you need to do basically immoral things. And therefore he believes that, okay, the, uh, the politics has its own logic and is separated from morality. But but those are not uh, things that that far we can accept because for him, politics and virtues are not separated as for Magyar.
So I understand. And, you know, Al Farabi was in a position where he wanted, in your words, to tame, you know, to tame jihad, but he was not in a position to overtly criticize, because even to possibly offer suggestions to tame it would be perceived as being overt criticism to an integral part of Islam, and therefore he was not in a because of the social mores at the time, he could not so directly attack. Right. So basically, he he's a, he's a teacher. I mean, he's he's lava. Uh, people call it the, the Ma'alla Montani. He's a second teacher after Aristotle. So he's a teacher, and if you're a teacher, I mean, you just don't tell the student this one. It's it's true, you know. You you you, you make them to think. You know you basically sometimes go along with their prejudices. You know, okay, that's your belief, let's see now. Now see what's gonna be the result. And you see the result and say, well, it's not that that it's good of the idea. You know, it's not uh, either it's not consistent or either it just leads to like destructive results. Therefore it's not a good uh, that's that's a better way of teaching that so it's, it's a Socratic way of teaching, you know? mm -hmm. So that's what that father was doing. Yes, please. I may have missed it, but I think in the beginning, early part of it, he was contradicting Marx by saying religion was essential to human development, but you were then coming on and saying that there's a problem with perpetual war, and so how does how, how do you see religion in an Islamic sense evolving? <coughs> Well, uh, the notion of offensive jihad actually fostered that, that ambition right. for, for expanding lands, you know. Um, uh, some Muslims did that their religion um, was superior to others, therefore they thought that they are doing favor to other people <coughs> to conquer them and convert them to Islam, either through not always compulsion, but sometimes compulsion, but sometimes through like extra tax or sometimes give them freedom. But um, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, offensive jihad can can foster that ambition or encourage that <coughs> desire for for conquest. Yes, please. I have a very general question. Okay. This is not my area of interest, mm -hmm. but I know there are literally thousands of studies mm -hmm. about al Farabi during the past thousand years. Even the latest one, I see it in utopian studies. A very important article, I think by Persian scholar, citing his work as a utopian example mm -hmm. of non-Western area. But this is not the issue. I admire you for ha handling this topic, given the fact that there are so many studies I recall my late colleague, Mohsen Mandi, okay. working on al Farabi for years. Mm. <laughs> so I'm wondering, given the fact that you did not mention any scholar, how is your interpretation or approach differs from many others, whether in Arabic, and by the way, in Arabic, there is a very active interest going on, especially in Morocco and Tunisia, yeah, with Jabri and others in Tunisia. So it is an extremely difficult topic you are dealing with. Well, well yeah, it's a <coughs> difficult topic, but the fact that I can mention it doesn't mean I'm not indebted to, to the mind and well from Monson and I admire him. Uh, but what I do think about al Farbi, I think that no, he's not the is not arguing for utopia. Utopia is a modern phenomenon. And it, it doesn't mean that Farabi as a philosopher could not logically <coughs> think about the possibility of it. But for him, it's not desirable. It's not something that you, you, you need to strive for because it's a sign of immoderation in the soul because it shows your excessive love for honor. And as a reasonable person, it's not healthy for your soul, it's not healthy for the city. Therefore, you should not strive for it. But he coined the term Al Madina al Fadil. Mabani al Ara al Madina al Fadil. Yes. Ara, it, it, he talks about others' people. Yes. Why well, I say that? 
he mentions many opinions of people, but because I quote someone, doesn't mean that I agree with them. I just express opinions. So that's a difference. Yes, al farabi expresses different opinions that sometimes conflicting views. But how can you make sense of this conflicting view? Which one is his? That's, that's a difficulty of understanding. He doesn't tell you that's my idea. This is what I believe. Because again, he's a, he's a Socratic teacher. He, he hides his teaching and makes the, the, the student actually find the truth for themselves, so not tell them that's the truth. So the so many scholars who label him as an author of a new doctrine. Those are do, those are modern, I think, misconception of al Farabi. I mean, like Paul Cooper says, like Republic Plato, mm -hmm. that you know, he was responsible for. Uh, for tyranny, no, I mean for utopia. It's it's not it's not uh, utopia. So you argue against this notion in your dissertation. I'm sorry. Do you argue against the notion? Utopia notion of, of, of yes, yes. And you refer to Mahdi Strauss. No, no, definitely. There are uh, schools of right, right, right. <coughs> After uh, the present, as we speak. Yes. So maybe that's the reason that why among the later Muslim philosophers, political philosophy was not in the center of their attention. Well, actually, that, that's a question that I'm puzzling with because the way actually Farabi characterizes philosophy, so it was really hard to miss that for the later philosophers. I still looking for that answer. What happened? I mean, um, maybe, I don't know, one theory is that basically the Islamic law becomes so potent and powerful that basically people say that, okay, that, that, that's basically sufficient for, for philosophy of thinking. And, but, but philosophy of thinking has always existed in Islamic civilization. But what um, goes away is thinking about a city as a fundamental, the, the, the relationship between human soul and its connection with the city. So that, mind, some, some mystics, they just go and focus on the study of the soul, you know, without <coughs> missing the connection between soul and city. And, and other religious people, uh, like the Shadraun, so basically they saw politics from, from, from the point of view of the Shad, yeah. the Islamic law. Yeah. Therefore, they thought that maybe there's no need for human reason to talk about uh, how they uh, basically um, live their lives in a city. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, but I'm not sure again. But sure. Yes. So, is your paper agrees with? Leo Strauss' understanding of Farabi and reading him as an esoteric philosopher? Mm -hmm. in, yes. what, in what sense? Like, like, could you please explain this more? Like, how, how, can, how did you refer to Leo Strauss? Okay, so basically, Al Farabi has a short summary on Plato's law, do you know? Mm -hmm. So, that's a fascinating piece. I mean, if you want to understand Farabi and you want to understand Plato, we need to just read this carefully multiple times. So basically, Farabi, he says that uh, uh, Plato was a great teacher, but he never told the student what the truth is. He always hid his intention. And he gives a story about it. He says that, okay, to explain that Plato's uh, attitude of writing or conversation with the reader was like this story. And as the story goes, there's a pious man, and he lives within a city, and he's afraid of his life because the tyrant is after him to kill. And that's, that's a pious person, and everybody knows that he's a pious person. And one day, he goes to the gate and talks to the god, let's say that, and the god asks him, who are you? He said, I'm a drawn person. 
and uh, the guys said, oh, go away, I know you, you're, you're a very nice person, you're going to be drawn. I said, what do you want? And he said, I want to go out. And the guard let him go out. Um, so, no, 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 I'm sorry. The story goes that he pretends that he's drunk while he's not drunk. And he says that, uh, who are you? He say that, I'm a pious person. And so if you're a pious person, well, you're drunk, so you're lying. And, 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 and then um, the guard lets him go out. So by doing this, he doesn't lie in speech, but he lies in action because he wasn't drunk. He pretended to be drunk. So he says that Plato's, uh, uh, Plato's attitude of communication, way of communicating with the reader, is like a dispious man. So he doesn't lie in speech, but there is somehow concealing the truth. And if you're the student, you need to look for this hidden truth to find it. So ancient writers, they were not like us, sloppy modern writers. You know? They were very crafty people. They just created masterpieces, not just said, OK, I'm going to do this like I say today. This is my thesis. I'm going to defend it. They, they didn't do that. You know? They wanted to make you think because, first of all, they were not busy as us. You know? they were for, for, for them, thinking was more serious. Uh, like in modern world, thinking mostly become instrumental. Uh, just have you do things and do practical things, rather than just having time to think and, and seeking it through for its own sake. You know. So. so does this mean you 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 uh, you state that Liu Strauss reads Al Farabi correctly? Uh, it's, sorry, Al Farabi correctly. I mean, it's. A, I, I I cannot say that. If I say that, I will not be a good student of philosophy. You know, if I just say that okay, that person just whatever I say is true about that person, you know, it's very unphilosophical. But I think that he has a point. He has an argument, and it's a worthy of research. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that Mahadevi um, saw that happiness is is not universal. There are different facets in each person because different natures of soul can follow that within a society differently. Uh, and you also mentioned Aristotle in a way that I was thinking: How would um, if Aristotle defines happiness as being at work in Nicomachean ethics? How would Mahadevi? Uh, relate that to the uh, positions in society and working. So can, can you repeat that part? Aristotle, how do you find Aristotle? Yeah, well, Aristotle, like, with his ideology of the mediums between being conceived or, for example, being conceived or being humble mm -hmm. or being at work is happiness. Um, oh. Okay, so in, in general, I mean, Aristotle, the um, um, account of happiness in the Republican ethics is different than in politics. So basically, yeah. in, in in Nicomachean ethics, it's basically happens through contemplation mm -hmm. without engaging in, in uh, public life. But in politics, it's different because basically his main idea in politics is happiness, is social life and community of life. So uh, I saw two points that's relevant to you know, the issue of happiness that Kafarov builds too. It's basically happiness requires just theoretical thinking or it requires practical thinking too. So again, Aristotle is not very clear, and we can argue maybe both, maybe just theoretical. It depends on how you read uh, Aristotle. Some people say that, that that's again uh, Aristotle's uh, intention to basically give two conflicting view, to give two conflicting view to a group of people. One sees political life as primary, the other sees the, the philosophical as primary. And once these two basically do, struggle with each other, they create a kind of check and balance, you know. So, I don't know, that's just which one is true. Uh, <clears throat> yes? I was curious about how you see these ideas translating into sort of the modern moment in regards to, um, you know, religion having a role versus, you know, today's society we see kind of this, mm -hmm. these diverging aspects of what role religion actually plays for your people. Um, and how you think his ideas would translate into like sort of this modern era? 
Uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, today's uh, main problem in the Middle East is, is just this political ambitions coupled with religious zeal. Mm -hmm. That makes some part of it relevant today. So when I started my research, that part of my father that captured me was exactly this. I mean, Al it doesn't doesn't provide an institutional solution for that. I mean, in modern world, we say that okay, we have states, we have this institution, we have laws, we enforce people. Even if they are not good people, they have to be good citizens. But for Al Farabi, being good citizen and good good person, they are not divergent. They are, they are, they are overlap. Right. So uh, uh, no, I'm not saying that Al Farabi that provides the, the complete solution for that problem today but he provides solutions for, for political ambition and, and, and religious uh, passions. And, and it's not just the Muslim walls, I mean, all over, I mean, Christian, Jews, they brought into the addition for the Thank you very much for a fascinating talk.